Well, it wow. is 10 o'clock, which means it's time for another Vinnie Mark webinar. And today's format is a little unusual in that instead of having a whole panel of experts, we have just one. Our guest today is Vinnie Mark's brand portfolio director, Helen Cock, and she's going to be answering questions around distilling a brand's core values and then taking those values and learning how to focus production around them. Now, in previous talks, uh, Helen has referred to a leadership strategy that was developed by author Gordon Treadgold called the FAST technique. And she's taken these ideas around focus and accountability and simplicity and transparency, and she's applied them directly to the wine industry. But today, she's applied them with three distinct goals in mind, and that is to increase profits, to increase creativity. And the third goal is to achieve those first two goals without cannibalizing existing wine categories. So as is always the case with Vinnie Mark webinars, we want to provide practical, actionable takeaways. So of course, there will be some theory, but mostly we hope to present ideas that can be applied immediately and that will drive our businesses forward in 2023. So Helen, thank you so much for taking time to share your insights with us today. Thanks, Jono. And if, if I can add any value to, to the industry, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to get straight into it because our first goal seems very direct. And, and that is that uh, we want to increase profits. But obviously, there are obstacles to that. Otherwise, everyone would be doing it. There are external threats and internal threats. So I thought before we kick into the framework as a whole, it would be useful for you to differentiate between these two types of problems uh, and explain where the FAST technique is best applied. I agree, Jono. Um, we all face, uh, face with internal and external threats, but I think the internal threats are, are the most important because these are controllable. These are the ones that are in the control of the brand and the business. So I would say the FAST framework should first and all be uh, applied on internal controllable threats. Now, we, the external threats like you know, change in the economy, um, economic situations, uh, consumer preferences, we can control and plan for those to a certain degree, but always start with the internal threats first. Um, so do you want me to explain a couple of how I see the FAST model can be applied to some of the internal threats? Yeah, I think that's that's really the best way to go. Okay. So I think, you know, first of all, if, if there's a lack of focus, um, that that sometimes can be seen if a, if a brand or a business becomes too scattered and the effort, efforts, and it really then the brands and the businesses become too, it's too difficult for them to different, them, differentiate themselves from their competitors. And there's a couple of key questions that the brands or the businesses need to ask themselves first and foremost. Um, to, to figure out and, and regain focus. And these are simple questions. It's the questions like, who is the brand? What is their target market? You know, what is their goal? What do they want to achieve? Um, what are their essential marketing tools? And these, these factors or questions, I almost want to encourage brands to ask themselves these questions before they uh, produce a brand or before they produce a product. Um, because it's a lot easier unpacking those questions first rather than producing a product and then trying to go and find a demand or a, or a market for it. Um, I think the, the second uh, internal threat is a lack of accountability. And this is when there's no accountability for the actions or the decisions made for, from a business or a brand point of view. And this often happens if there's a lack of um, role, role or um, responsibility definition, um, or there's no met metrics available to actually hold the keep or keep the stakeholders accountable. And here, again, there's a couple of key questions that the brands or businesses can ask themselves to, to establish if there is a lack of accountability. And the questions are, you know, who will do the work? Who is ultimately responsible for the success of the brand? Who are the key stakeholders in the, in the total value chain? What is their core needs? Um, what is their roles and responsibilities? And then also looking to see if, we've, if they've got the metrics, as I said, to measure these uh, stakeholders to keeping them accountable. And these could be simple measures like, you know, is there sales targets in place? Is there growth hurdles in place uh, for the customers? And putting agreements in place with all the stakeholders and clearly define what wants to be achieved um, on, a, on a brand or a business level. Um, I think the, the third internal threat around simplicity is how will we achieve uh, our goals? 
Um, and brands, this often comes down to if there is no plan, if the brand doesn't have a plan or doesn't know what they want to achieve. And, and this makes it extremely hard for a distributor, a customer, or a consumer even to engage with the brand if they don't understand what this brand is all about or what they are trying to achieve. And it's most important here to once again, start and define who's your target market, figure out what your brand needs to increase sales because it, it differs from brand to brand. You know, Does your brand need more uh, awareness? Does the brand need better strategic pricing? Does the brand need better uh, consumer campaigns or competitions to increase the rate of sale? Um, you know, is it as simple as is it is your website or your social media pages easy enough for a consumer to navigate? So really get down to what is it that you want to achieve and simplify those those elements. And I think then lastly, the, the last internal threats that needs to be evaluated through the fast framework is transparency. You know, why are we doing what we're doing? And, and if there is no not transparency, it can often relate to a, a mistrust. And that could be a mistrust between the distributor, the customer, or the consumer side, if there isn't transparency um, for a brand or a business. Fantastic. So I hope those of you who are at home listen that that is the a perfect groundwork for the rest of this webinar, because you've outlined each category and there will be time throughout this session for questions to be submitted. So now that we know what each of those categories roughly refers to, we're going to work through them one by one. So Helen, you, you mentioned at the beginning with focus, you, there are certain questions you can ask yourself as a business owner. And I think those are fantastic. But if I'm honest, for a business owner like myself, who has a touch of ADHD, sometimes it's hard to focus long enough to even realize that I have a lack of focus, uh, often get into the cycle of, you know, just do, just do, be proactive, but to actually stop and slow down and assess the business is uh, sometimes doesn't come naturally. So outside of the questions that you mentioned earlier, can you give us perhaps some symptoms that are warning signs to a business owner that their business may lack focus? I don't think it's just you with ADHD. I think our industry, we are naturally optimistic. We're naturally entrepreneurial. So there's so many shiny pennies that we, we would like to take up, uh, up the opportunity. Um, but that can become a challenge for, for everybody from a business or brand point of view. So there's several symptoms that can serve as warning signs for a brand or a business that there's, there's a lack of focus. And I'm going to share a couple of examples with you from, from what I've seen in my experience over the years. First is a, a lack of clarity. Now, when a brand lacks focus, it may actually struggle to define its purpose and its goals clearly. And the very quick test that a brand or a business can do is just ask the, your fellow team members, what does the brand stand for? What is the unique selling points? Um, you know, who, who are we targeting with these products? And, and of, most often, even your internal teams cannot answer, answer those questions. And also, when you, when you unpack the um, lack of clarity around your brand, <clears throat> you need to make sure that your unique, unique selling points are so strong that it mustn't be just the winemaker that is able to sell the product onto a customer. A salesperson must be equipped with just as strong, unique selling points to, to convince a customer or consumer almost to buy your product. Um, the, uh, the second symptoms that I often see is poor performance. And often what happens if a brand lacks focus purely because they, they don't have a, defi a defined goal target market, or if they have too many products, they, their focus becomes scattered, their resource allocation becomes scattered or diluted. Um, and all of those elements have a, a negative impact on, on profitability or creativity. Um, and what I often see happens is that as soon as poor perform performance kicks in, the first reaction for a brand is they want to increase their distribution. And, and this you can see, you know, if there's not a clearly defined target market, having a thousand spas available in the South African market and you're only available in 200 automatically gives you the impression that there's 800 that still has an opportunity for your product. But what brands need to realize, those stores that you are not in does not automatically mean that there's a shopper or consumer looking for your brand. We're all different. We all have different incomes. We all have different taste uh, profiles. So that, that's a, one of the key elements or warning signs is poor performance. Um, Jono, 
Then also difficulty making decision and being overwhelmed by, by stress. You know, if you don't know where you want to go and there's, there's a lack of focus, you struggle to make decisions confidently. You struggle to explain confidently what your brand stands for and where you want to go. And that also has a, a negative impact in the end on profitability and creativity. Um, and then definitely, as I said, the wasted resources. You if you don't have focus, you're diluting your resources available. And we all know the resources in the wine industry isn't as much as if you compare it to a cider category or spirits category. So rather than scattering your resources across a portfolio, clearly define what are your core business products and then go after your core targeted uh, consumer market as well. Well, I appreciated the way you, you talked about focusing on who you are, but also that actually does extend to the borders of the of the business, which is where you are available. I think perhaps not everyone makes that connection. As you said, they think that if I know who I am, then I should be everywhere, but uh, that's not necessarily yes. true. But you also mentioned uh, talking about too many products in a portfolio, and that might be a symptom of a lack of focus. But having, having read a little bit about the work that you've done historically, there have been times where as a business strategist, you've brought focus to a brand by introducing new products and at other times focus has meant getting rid of products so how does one know what type of focus is required given that it's not that simple to figure out Donna that's a difficult uh, question with no one right answer and I can promise you anybody that's in a position that's deciding to color product does not take it lightly um, purely because I mean we all work with or mainly work with family businesses and there's a, um, a livelihood issue or at stake so it's not something we take lightly. Um, but as a brand owner, it's important to, to almost do a check-in on your products and your brand health um, during, during a, every, a couple of months is and really determining, you know, what do you need to focus on to increase profitability? As in the end of the day, we are running businesses to be profitable. Um, so there's a couple of factors that, that a brand um, or even us from a distributor point of view consider when having these discussions with our, with our brand partners. And first and foremost is market, dem market demand. You know, analyze the customer feedback, analyze the sales data and some market research. Um, and uh, Anaret, if you can go over to the next slide, because it does give you a really good indication. So this is the reality of the market currently. There's over 1,100 brands and only 53 generate 80% of our major retailers' sales. So how many opportunities is there really to, or how much more market demand is there really to create more products or brands? So we do try and guide our brands, for example, on you know how big is the market size? How big is the, uh, the various cultivars from a retailer perspective? How many products are available in each cultivar and what is their turnover uh, per product? Because these are all elements that retail buyers look at before they actually consider listing a new brand or, or a new product. So if a, if a brand then decides that they want to bring out, for example, a, a new Pinot Noir, but currently no data or research shows, can prove almost that there's a consumer demand for it. Based on the, the market demand, you know, it doesn't add a lot of um, um, profitability or turnover to a retailer's life. And there's already, there might already be 200 or 300 Pinot Noirs available. So that's one of the key things we look at first. Is there a market demand for it? Um, in, in guiding brands, if, they, if there's an opportunity to produce a new product, or if we do see the market demand is in decline, then really doing some introspection to see, do you really need that product in your portfolio? And does it add value to your overall brand positioning? I think a second um, factor that we always consider is product differentiation. You know, when you consider adding an extra product to your portfolio, once again, is there a gap for it? Is there a demand for it? Is another 50 Rand Sauvignon Blanc going to be so completely different to the other 150 Rand Sauvignon Blancs in the market? So if you cannot offer a very clear or bigger dif uh, differentiation on your product, we do discourage additional, pro or additional products to be to added to a portfolio. And then once again, cost effectiveness and resource allocation. Unfortunately, we can't get away from that. Um, we all need to be profitable in the, in the end of the day. 
So you you had an amazing anecdote about KWV's Annabelle sparkling wine. Now, KWV has an absolutely enormous portfolio, right, which can some feel like a, a lack of focus at certain times. And yet, this is one of those times where new introduction was exactly what was needed. The focus was there. Can you, I mean, maybe just to ground what you've been talking about in an example, can you tell us the story? Yeah, Johnny, this question made me think a little bit. So I had to go and look at the packaging of Annabelle to see if there's any real mention to link Annabelle to Cad Levy's an overarching brand. And besides the 1988, uh, 1918, there's no real reference linking Annabelle to Cad Levy as an overarching brand. Um, KWV is a, is a company that's managed to develop quite a lot of brands. If you look at their portfolio, like Bordeaux Esperance, Labory, Golden Khan, Cafe Culture, and Annabelle. So they leverage the strength of the KWV brand from a manufacturing point of view and resource point of view. But they very specifically identified a, a niche target market for Annabelle as a brand and developed a brand that's targeted at that target market. Uh, if that makes sense. So, and, and I think another brand that's done this extremely successful, um, if I have a look in, in our portfolio, is the Book Notes Clerk brand, where you really have extremely ultra premium brands like Book Notes Clerk, Cap Maritime, Porcelainberg, uh, aspirational brands like Chocolate Block, and then more affordable brands like Wolf Trap, Benologist, and Porcupine Rich. So, once again, you can say, well, isn't that confusing? Isn't that a lack of focus? But I say, no, these two brands are, are extremely successful. The importance of this strategy was, is that they clearly defined a target market and developed and created a brand with regards to packaging, intrinsics, price point, and marketing strategy tailored at a very specific target market. So in this way, I think Annabelle is the perfect example uh, of, of from an overall KWB portfolio focus point. Um, as they now have their library, focusing on Cup de Six, and they have the Annabelle focusing um, on, the, on the sparkling sweeter, sweeter targeted market. Um, and I think the other reason why I also use Annabelle as an example, I remember when they, when they launched it, they also had a very specific focus strategy. They went into checkers first from a distribution point of view, but even besides that, by the time it landed on, on my desk as a buyer at Macro, all the cues just aligned. It was the perfect price, the perfect packaging, the perfect intrinsics for a very specific target market. So that's why I use that, always use that brand as a, as a focus example. Well, I think one of the interesting points you brought out there was that uh, you said it, it didn't have anything to do with KWV necessarily, or didn't communicate directly anything about the company of KWV, mm. but it stood alone as a, a very focused product. And maybe what's worth teasing out there is that a company can launch separate brands, but each one of those brands need to have their own focus and position. And that's not quite the same as perhaps launching another product under your own brand. Exactly, that, Jono. That, maybe you can just tease out a little more on, on that idea. Uh, I 100% agree with you. Um, you know, there, there has been brands like... I've worked with Draw Style uh, in the past, so that, uh, that example comes to mind immediately, is where Draw Style as a brand had the capability to produce more and more products. Um, and then at one stage, they, they were playing in the box wine category, sweet wine category, um, and then they wanted to start venturing into the cultivar category, because obviously the, the profitability is a lot higher on cultivar products than, than blended and specifically sweet products. Um, almost capturing a wider consumer market. And there was a reason um, why I decided that stage also decided to not almost discontinue those cultivars because it started fragmenting the focus. It started fragmenting the resource allocation. Um, and they not saying they started losing focus on their, on their, their big blends like the Autobracht, for example. But once they moved away from the cultivars, they became extremely focused on Autoproft as one of the strongest products in the, in the wine industry at the moment. Um, and then they started with Glass 750, 1.5, and I think it was a three liter, if I remember correctly. And they, they once again reviewed their, their focus and are slowly moving towards just box wine, releasing a, a five liter and a one liter. So that for me is a good example of continuous, in, 
continuously evaluating the market, the demand, the strengths of the brand, and cutting away what doesn't serve that purpose, and then focusing on a strength. Well, so I know we're talking about the fast technique, but focus seems like it's actually a slow activity. Without getting too mystic, I would say there's an element of meditation to focus, which means you have to stop doing for a while and just think about the business processes. And it's essentially, I guess, it's kind of like distilling. You, know, you, need to, you need to distill out the right things to do in your business. But then there is a return to action, right? Because you actually have to go and do them. And I think this brings us nicely to our next point, which is accountability. Once you've distilled out what are the right things to do, you need to allocate those roles to people. I wondered if, if we could talk a little bit about some of the things you've encountered, the sort of systemic causes of poor accountability in, in a brand. How do you know if you have a problem in this area? You know, Jono, I think a lot about this specifically in our industry. And I think it's also because our industry has evolved over the years. You know, back in the days when there was less brands, you know, the, the main sales levers that you had to pull almost was just a discount, you know, if you had it or, or price. And the more brands started coming into the category, now we had to almost step up our game. You know, now we had to go out and actually market or identify uh, the differentiation on each brand or product and start marketing it. Then more needs started coming in from our, from our retailers. Now you had, to, you had to throw in a shopper marketing element to it. And now you need to, the industry had to understand how do we appeal to the shopper? And then we're not even at the consumer yet. So all of these needs as it has evolved also changed the roles and responsibilities and, and almost asked for different skill sets. And I do think the challenge we face within the industry, the demands on the consumer and the customer side drove a lot of the change and the pace is a lot faster than what the industry can almost uh, adapt to in, in, in um, fulfilling the needs of these um, um, different stakeholders. And so the roles also started blurring. So I think to determine the, the biggest thing determining the, the problem of accountability is really first to identify what is the brand accountable for. Um, and I think the, the, the systemic issue almost that creates the, the most noise is around the overall brand management. Now, who is essentially accountable for, for the brand success now that there's more stakeholders in the value chain that participates in, in getting or creating a successful brand? Um, so if you look at the overall brand management, you know, that involves strategic activities and decisions that brand owners need to take to develop a brand, to create perception in the market, um, creating marketing campaigns, uh, creating a brand identity. And the brand owner needs to look for anything that can impact the decline of the demand for the brand, be it from a perception or equity side or from a sales side. So... There's a couple of things um, that I can that I've identified over the years that can can be almost warning signs, and that's negative reviews or feedback or customer complaints. You know, if you start seeing there's a lack of engagement on your social media pages um, or a lack of feedback from from your customers, um, and it, it all boils down to almost relationships breaking down and communication breaking down. And most of the time, if there's a lack of accountability, it's because there's unmet needs versus expectations. So that, that's kind of the key thing that I've identified. So you, you mentioned just an inter interesting little differentiation, which I thought perhaps needs a little bit of explaining for some people. You talked about the difference between the shopper and the, cons and the end consumer. Mm. Um, can you just expand a little bit on that for those who might not have, have understood the difference? Yeah, sure. So in, in, in a marketing world, a consumer is the person that actually physically consumes the product, where you might have somebody going into a customer um, that shops the product, but takes it to somebody else to consume the product. And both of those could have different needs and also have different triggers almost that they look for or influence them in taking a product off the shop. I mean, I think if you're a consumer, you kind of know which brand or technically know which brand, which product you want, where if you're a shopper buying somebody for somebody to consume as a gift, for example, and you're not familiar with a category, 
then other elements start playing, uh, coming to play. You know, you know, have I heard about the brand? Um, what does what role does price play when I choose a product with the brand? Do I see the, you know which which product or brand am I attracted to on the shelf? So those two really have different needs, and it's a different marketing skill. It can become quite blurred, but it is a different marketing skill um, attracting a consumer versus a shopper. And sometimes they're all the same. Yes. So is it fair to say that there's quite a strong gender divide? Uh, in wine when it comes to shopping specifically? I don't have the research, research and stats for something, a question like that, Jono, but uh, I think traditionally, uh, traditionally grocer will, uh, will be more um, female orientated or shopper because traditionally uh, women go and do the grocery shopping as well, where I think the, the liquor side or the liquor store business is still very much male targeted because there's hard liquor and beer uh, in that space as well. Fascinating. Well, when you were talking earlier about uh, this uh, accountability, of, uh, especially when it comes to brand well-being, it, it just felt like you were talking about leadership. Uh, and I think perhaps, would you, would you say that's a fair assessment? Yes, because in essence, uh, brand, there's a, there is an element of brand leadership as well. Because, I mean, it does feel like sometimes we look at a business and go, well, here are silos, here are industrial sort of areas of things that need to be done. And now everyone must do their job and make sure that the product gets to the customer. But each one of those nodes can be performed in an inspired fashion or not. And, and really the, the brand owner has the responsibility to ensure that the why, that the root cause behind the business filters down to the rest of those nodes. So I wondered if just perhaps to, even if just to provide an analytical framework, can you just outline each one of the nodes in a classic uh, chain to market between the producer and the end consumer? Yeah, and Rex, I think if you go um, further, a couple of slides to accountability, who will do the work, that's quite a nice framework of where we can just explain uh, the next one. Yeah, this is a nice framework that breaks it down on just a perspective of what the current market looks like when it comes to who's responsible, who's accountable, and who can be consulted and um, informed. So take, starting from a producer point of view, Jono, and I think here sometimes you also get blurred with the terminology where producer can be referred to as a, as a brand as well in our industry. That's why we very specifically distinguish between brand and, and producer. But the producer in essence, I mean, is all about you know, the, the grapes, the harvesting and turning it into wine. And this is the first node in the, in the process and in the chain of influence. And they have a significant impact on quality, taste uh, and price of the wine. So factors that can influence the producing side of accountability, you know, that's more things like you know, which resources, uh, clim climatic conditions, soil, grape variety. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, I'd rather focus on brand distributor and customer from a, from a business point of view. So from a, from a responsibility point of view, you know, they, the brand is once again responsible for the brand management, creating the demand for the brand, not just for the, to the distributor, because they, they need to excite the sales force about it, mm -hmm. but also to, to the customer, they need to explain what the unique selling points and the value add of, of actually purchasing and then reselling this um, brand is going to be. And also from a consumer perspective, I always say to our brand partners, you as a brand owner have a responsibility to almost place or create a demand in a consumer's mind before they go into the customer. So that's the way I always see it. It starts with a, with a brand owner creating that demand for product, be it with the, the other nodes as well. Then um, as distribution models also changed over the years, the distributor is playing a lot larger role in, when it comes to response, being responsible for the success of the, um, of the brand. Um, and purely because we are driven by the needs of our customers and the needs of our customers are asking for more engagement from a marketing platform point of view and the understanding of trade marketing and developing um, campaigns around the shopper to pull more feet into, into the category as well as from a strategic point of view in guiding on pricing where products should be available um, and putting campaigns to 
together for some brands, depending on the maturity and the skill sets available. So that has definitely changed over the years, Jono, I would say, where in the past, the traditional model was always, you know, it's the walls and walls service. Um, it, it's not the same, uh, in, uh, I would say, and I definitely, the, the role of the, the distributor is going to become more and more complex um, um, as, the, as the market changes. And then um, from a customer point of view, from a responsibility point of view, they also have a responsibility to, to market the product. Um, but here it becomes important, once again, that the brand clearly defines who and what they are for the retailer to understand of what they need to do with your product, which, which marketing platforms are more suitable. Um, and I mean, I can honestly say, I remember when I, when I started at Macro, there was like 3,000 active products in the master data. There is no way that any retail buyer can keep their finger on the pulse on understanding every brand and product or figuring out every brand and product. So very important that the brand always understands and communicates to a customer of who and what they are. Sorry, Helen, just quickly, can you, can you clear up? Maybe I'm just getting confused. The customer in this particular um, accountability screen is the, is the retailer, not yes. the end consumer. Yeah. Yeah, is yeah, that, yeah. Okay. Customers is in, in, in our world is always the, the retailer. Okay. But for a, for a wine brand, perhaps a smaller wine brand who's looking to get their product through to market, the customer is someone who is going to resell their product rather than someone who's going to buy it for home consumption. That's correct, John. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So, Helen, I know, and this is why it's so enriching listening to you talk, because you've had the opportunity to work with brands and then also as a distributor. Um, you, you've managed to be that customer and you've also managed to be in the distribution load. So you can empathize at multiple nodes in this chain. And so I, I wondered if maybe you can share a few examples with us that will illustrate perhaps where things fall down most commonly. Where are the sources of confusion? Because this idea of, well, everyone has their job and they need to do it. That doesn't seem like a very complicated idea. And yet people do get it wrong. Um, can you perhaps help us uh, tease that issue out? Sure, Jono. Um, I think it, it, it all boils back at once again to, to brand management. Who is responsible to create the demand for, for the product in which stage before it reached the, reach the consumer? So once again, the brand owner is responsible and accountable for that overall brand management and creating the demand to the distributor and the customer and the consumer. Um, whereas, you know, the distributor role, the core role is to make sure that the products reach uh, the customers, uh, building relationships with our customers. Um, but as I said, as these models have evolved over time, um, the role of the distributor has become more and more intertwined with um, the success of the brand. So that's why you will see distributors spending a lot more time and investing in a lot more skills and resources to support the brands that do not have the resources to put brand strategies together, to put trade marketing activities together, guiding on strategic pricing um, or where products should be uh, and which stores products should be placed. And then going down to a level and really guiding brand, brands as well on who their competitive set is. So that's why I say the distributor role is going to become more and more important. I think the, the biggest demand for a distributor role is still the walls and wheels and the sales force, because that is extremely expensive um, to invest in. But there's also that element of brand management that um, is definitely required and it's going to become a bigger requirement from our customers and our consumers as this uh, category evolves. Uh, and as consumers become more educated, almost, in understanding the category. So we are now halfway through, and I just wanted to in, in remind those at home that uh, during this time, you're welcome to submit questions during the time that Helen will then be able to answer. So we've covered two of the four pillars. We've talked about focus, and we've been talking recently about accountability. So Trade Gold's Fast Framework has a third pillar, which is simplicity. So Helen, I wanted to to talk about this a little bit, because to be honest, simplicity as a term sometimes is so vague to the point of almost being meaningless. And mm -hmm. just one example that pops up is I think of Uber as a business, right? The idea of what Uber wanted to achieve was super simple, but the execution of that idea is extraordinarily complex. So in your, in your mind, can you tease out what you mean 
by simplicity in the context of improving business profits. Sure, Jono. Um, Anderita, if you can just go to the start of the simplicity section, please. Yeah, and then just stop here, because I always look at this picture as to explain simplicity. I mean, simplicity from a business context, Jono, could definitely mean, you know, removing or minimizing complexity when it comes to uh, operations, processes, and products. But this slide sums up the biggest challenge we sometimes face in the industry with regard to simplicity. What is the plan? A lot of brands don't have a plan. And, and I always use this slide because they, I've seen all five of these stages when engaging with, with customers and with brands and be, being from a customer side as well. If there's not a plan, a plan or the plan is so complex, then nobody can execute the plan. Um, so simplicity for me at its core is really about reducing complexity and actually having a plan for your brand and business. So, um, Steve, so, so Steve Jobs once said, he said, simple can be far harder than complex. Now you said like, we got to have a plan, but how, how do we do that? How do we, can you, can you give us some examples perhaps mm. of, yeah, of I think, brands that um, have managed to achieve this ethos? Yeah. Um, do you want me to just go through a couple of brands or that have yeah, actually achieved I mean, I mean, I think, simplicity? Sure. I think even the idea of having a plan, you can have a plan that's very complicated. Um, is, is that okay? Or does simplicity, I mean, how far do we need to distill this down? I think that's what I'm trying to trying to understand for myself. Yeah, well, if we if we have a look at, just look at how we can simplify a marketing plan, for example. Um, and it all boils down, once again, who's your brand and who's your target market? But you can use pricing, for example, to, to simplify your marketing strategy. You know, if a lot of brands have 10, 20 products, but each product has an individual price, where if you just streamline and, and almost create three tiers um, of ranges in your brand, you could very quickly streamline your pricing strategy where you have an entry level, a mid tier, and a, and a premium or top tier brand. Um, and that creates simplicity in the retailer's mind again. And you actually get a lot more bang for buck because what happens now, where traditionally you have to pay per advertising space, now you suddenly have two or three products playing in the same price bracket. So now you can advertise two or three products at the same price for one advertising slot. So it's small tweaks like that from, a, from simply looking at your, your pricing on your portfolio um, or your brand on how you can streamline or simplify it. Um, you know, you can always, you, uh, sticking to pricing is, you know, brands always need to make sure they keep the end consumer or the end shopper, the person actually purchasing the, the product off the shelf, start calculating your price backwards. What price do you see is realistic for a, for a shop or a consumer to pay for your brand? Keeping in consideration what the marginal business needs are of all the, the middlemen, be it a customer, be it a distributor, and then making sure whatever your, your input cost is actually still makes sense for you from a, from a profitability point of view. Um, and then I think another way of looking at or using pricing to as a marketing strategy tool to simplify your brand is always make sure if you've got different pack sizes that the the value contribution to the end consumer makes sense. You know, is there a value for a consumer to upgrade from a 750 mil to a 1.5 to a three liter to a five liter? So those are just one or using price as, a, as part of your marketing strategy of how you can simplify it. I think you can also simplify um, elements like packaging. We all know the industry is under a lot of pressure with regards to glass. Is it really necessary that you have four, five, six different bottle types on your brand? Is there maybe a way that you can simplify that and, and benefit, a benefit from economies of scale that once again impacts your profitability um, positively? Um, and also simplifying your product offerings. And this might go back to, to focus, but if you decide you want to be an ultra premium brand, why do you have a 50 Rand product in your, in your brand stable? And I do understand, uh, you know, most of the times it's those 50 Rand products that um, almost pay, pays the bills um, and you need economies of scale to be able to produce the ultra premium brands. But by simplifying your product range, you, be, you become a lot more clear 
um, on who you are as a brand as well. And it, then it becomes a lot easier to create a plan for your brand as well. So would you suggest, because I mean, I think there are a lot of businesses who would define themselves as a premium brand, especially in wine, and yet they need a, an, an entry-level product. Would, would you say that possibly a better idea then would be what we spoke about earlier of differentiating and creating two separate brands? I mean, because as you say, the advice sounds good, but to a guy who makes 60% of his revenue off uh, an entry-level product, but really wants to be a premium brand, how, would, how does he process that? Mm. Donna, that, no, that is a loaded question, um, and it's not an easy one to answer, as you know, the brands that I have seen being able to almost cut down on the entry-level products is brands that has got either foreign investment or very strong um, 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 stakeholders or investors, um, but the flip side is there's also brands that that's managed that process with and I'm thinking of brands like um, like a, a, um, a Villafonte and Our Stable or La Riche. We consciously started the process of who am I and not falling into that trap almost to bring or to start your brand with a 50 rand wine and then bolting on more ultra premium brands or ultra premium products. So it, it's a you that's why I say you have to ask yourself these questions before you almost start a brand or a product, um, as there is brands in the industry currently that sit in this conundrum, is they, the, the, it's almost compounded scenarios where they didn't make the right decision for the brand that's now compounded in a cash flow challenge. And then you're too far down the line to correct it almost. Again, I suppose that sort of differentiation comes from taking the time upfront to meditate slash focus, as we spoke about. Yeah. So we do have a question, and I think it refers back to the accountability pillar. So if we can just go back one step. Um, Carolyn Martin from Creation is asking, would it be good to educate reps on the WSET education framework? Uh, and as, as some, so that stakeholders can speak the same language as the distributors. Yes, Carolyn, that's definitely, I mean, I, I won't even go, it's not just WSET in the sense of, of actual product knowledge. Um, it's, it's almost an education level of breaching or creating a breach between sales and marketing or sales and brands to speak the same language so we can all pull together in the same direction. I'm not sure if I've answered her question. I think so, yeah. And, and, and that actually, we, we're moving perfectly on schedule because we've gone through three of the four uh, pillars in the FAST uh, framework. And we want to move on to the, the final one, which is transparency. But transparency, remember, with our goal of improving profits, increasing creativity, and doing so without cannibalizing existing wine category. So again, a little like simplicity, transparency can mean almost anything. So... Perhaps you can narrow this down for us specifically going, can we pinpoint where the most areas in business where transparency is perhaps glaringly missing? Uh, Donna, trans transparency in the, in the wine industry or business and brand industry for me means being honest about who and what you are and what your business performance looks like and really distilling it down to why. Why does your brand exist and why does your, why does your business exist? Because transparency is not just data or, or numbers transparency also comes back to leadership and decisions being made so so for me it's it's almost a combination of leadership and performance stats or analytics for for a lack of a better word so for me there's several areas that um that could become quite blurry or where transparency is lacking but once again, it's, I don't always think it's, uh, it's done on purpose. It comes down to the maturity of the brand and the business and the tools almost available to unpack a transparency or make things more transparent. So I think one of the aspects is relevant data um, and insights to, to make decisions. Um, and as I said, this is once again, not always due to a lack of trust but some businesses don't have the resources um, to go down to a granular data level to understanding profitability by product, by customer uh, or by market type and actually actually or accurately measuring um, those performance analytics. Um, but I think a, a, another element where yeah, it becomes more in the customer and the consumer space 
is around labeling and marketing. Um, and, and this could be a, con a, a sensitive topic, but you know, we do have, we operate in a very creative uh, industry. And I, I'm a firm believer that brands should always try and use their primary packaging in a, as creative way to tell your brand story, um, to, to attract uh, shoppers and consumers to your brand. And, but over the years, you know, terminology on, even on our labels have started confusing consumers. Um, if I think about, you know, these days you can get the word premium or reserve on a 50 rand wine and a 250 rand wine. So what is that, what is that telling the consumer? It's sending confusing or conflicting messages um, around products, brands, and, and the category. Um, and, uh, and another element um, that could cause confusion because there's no transparency is we also operate in an environment or a category where awards does impact the decision-making process, be it for a shopper or consumer. But the amount of competitions or wine challenges and award stickers that you see on labels these days or brands that create uh, uh, images that look like um, uh, award stickers. You know, that's also an element of transparency where we confuse customers and consumers and we're not being transparent about who and what the products uh, or the brands are. And, and I understand that because that you have to become creative to differentiate your product or your brand from, from the, the, the bottle next to you. But that's also for me is quite a touchy point in, in the industry where we're starting to become less and less transparent almost. So it seems like uh, transparency is not quite as clear as, as we need it to be. I mean, you touched on, on three issues there. Uh, it felt like there's internal knowledge, business analysis, right? You need to be able to see literally your business needs to be transparent mm -hmm. to you. Uh, and then you, you also touched on a little bit of, I guess, relational clarity just having various stakeholders understanding each other. And then the third thing you touched on felt like uh, consumer trust and, and communication with your consumer. Would you say that's a, that's a fair kind of summary? That's a very good summary, uh, Jono. Um, and it also comes down to you know, transparency in the data and analytics uh, impacts profitability first and foremost. Um, you know, the whole, la the transparency in labels and marketing, um, you know, that's all around uh, creating or enhancing creativity. And that, you know, we're trying to add cues to the products or brand to differentiate ourselves, but in the process, we can cannibalize the category. Yes. So let, can we talk a little bit about, I think relational clarity was, was one of the things I wanted to talk about because it come back, comes back again to what we were talking about earlier with accountability. You know, a, a brand obviously needs to trust the distributor, uh, and, and in turn, the customer needs to to trust the brand. So, can you maybe start off with the distributor? Can you outline? And obviously, you work for a distributor right now, so it should be fairly easy to do. But can you outline the hallmarks of what you think a trustworthy distributor looks like? What should producers be looking for? Mm -hmm. Jono, even though I, I work for a distributor, I think for total transparency, I am going to answer this question out of my experience being a distributor, but also working on brands that sit in distributor uh, portfolios, as well as from a customer point of view, because a distribute, trust in a distributor comes from brand and customer. So distributors always sit, sit in the middle. Um, for me, the key skills or characteristics um, for a trustworthy distributor include skills. You know, a, a trustworthy distributor needs the skills from a people, process, and technology perspective to address all business requirements, not just finance, it's operations, it's sales, it's brand, it's marketing, uh, it's, it's insights. So skills is definitely a hallmark of a, of a trustworthy um, distributor. Secondly is, is knowledge. Um, you know, the distributor needs to have a deep understanding um, of the products that they distribute. And Carolyn, this comes back to your point on, on WSET. Um, you know, it, it comes down to equipping your sales teams, your distributor partners um, with that, uh, that knowledge so they can understand how to distribute and sell um, uh, the wine products. Um, and knowledge also guides customers and broad brand partners with valuable insights on their sales, their pricing, and their, their marketing strategies. Uh, I think a third characteristic is agility. 
Um, besides that, a distributor needs to be reliable and consistent when it comes to, uh, you know, things like calling cycles, uh, delivery cycles. You know, customers have to trust us that we deliver uh, on time. I also think it's important for a distributor to be, be agile because the market um, environment is changing so, so quickly. Um, and the way I see a uh, uh, trustworthy distributor being agile is by always identifying what is the need for, for, the, for the brand as well as the customers and then yeah. upskilling their resources to support those needs. And that's why I said earlier as well, you'll see distributors start starting to employ and upskill their, their marketing department so that they understand brand, they understand trademark, and they understand communication strategy, social media. I mean that that's that skill set has evolved so much in the in the last couple of years, but also agility in the sense of let's use COVID as an example. Nobody in the industry really anticipated that, um, and uh, you know some distributors were more successful than others in being agile. In when you know when the retailers opened, they could adjust and change and adapt their um, their, their delivery cycles to make sure that they had stock first to the market. Um, so that's an element of agility for me that's, that's, import, that's important. But I think agility also comes down to having collaborative relationships. The closer your relationships are with your brands, as well as to your customers, the more agile you can be, because you can understand the needs and plan actively to adjust to those needs as well. Um, then I also think a, a key, <laughs> Characteristic or hallmark is training. Um, and this comes back to the conversation of up, continuously upskilling um, the departments within the distributor and actively make an effort to, to upskill their, their sales teams um, as well as the other departments. But I also think, and I, I'm a firm believer of training almost outside of your department or outside of your company, especially in our industry. The more we can train our customers, the, the, the support teams on the, on the retailer's ground that unpacks wines, have to talk wines in our absence, um, the better. Because the more people understand the wine category, the more they are more likely to come out of the spirits and the, um, and the beer category into, into ours. And I think lastly, a characteristic for me for a trustworthy distributor, Jono, is experience. You need to have a track record of success uh, in the industry. Um, so yeah, so ultimately, you know, a distributor needs to be relied upon to be to create success for the brand partners or producers that they that they distribute. Um, but I'm a firm believer that all stakeholders play a role, and you can only be an indispensable partner if there's a partnership mentality. And that's very important in the day and age of how distributors' roles has changed. So I think I think what you've been talking about now is. Uh, can be seen by some as quite a relief, I think, especially for smaller producers who are also brand owners. When they're spending time trying to focus on who they should be and where they should be, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that can become quite overwhelming. And perhaps it's comforting to know that a good distributor, which does exist, uh, can offer the sort of support when it comes to uh, brand needs and uh, and experience, so long as a brand knows who it needs to be. Um, so does that, is that, would you say that's roughly a good representation? Absolutely, Jono. Um, is, it, it all starts with a brand. Um, I, do, I do believe you know, distributors are upskilling in such a manner that they can also start guiding brands, figuring that out, but it makes it a lot easier if their brand already knows and are secure and who and what their brand are. It just planning and everything just flows a lot easier. So speaking of guiding brands, there's a question from Sophia Hawkins who asks, can you offer advice on how to go about identifying where your products should be? Um, and how can you maintain focus in knowing where your wines should be available and, your, and channel your brand awareness into these places rather than trying to make it available everywhere? Now, you, you spoke about it a little bit earlier, but perhaps you can unpack uh, on that on that notion that's a very good question Sophia um, you know in the, especially in our industry due to the lack of shopper and, and proper consumer research uh, the best tool that we use at this stage is almost first and foremost identifying 
um, the competitive set. So identify who are your top five competitors per product on your brand or on a brand level. But really unpacking, are they really your competitors first? Because there is a couple of icon brands in our industry that everybody wants to be, but they can't. So once you identified your top five um, competitors for that product, is then to go and have a look at if you've got access to, to sales out data um, of, of, the, of the market, is to go and see where are those top 50 or 100 or 200 stores where those five products are already selling successful. Because that gives you a kind of an indication of there could be a similar shopper, there could be a, cons a similar consumer um, that has the same resources to buy your product as well. That's kind of the first indication that, that we look for in when we're guiding our, our brands of where to be available, rather than taking a shotgun approach and say you can be available everywhere. And then Sophia, your second question was, how do you identify the platforms in those spaces um, to create brand awareness? Did I understand that correctly? That's, that's what we've got here, yeah. Okay. So that also varies from, from customer to customer at this stage, Jono. Um, I think the, the, the leaders of these marketing platforms is definitely uh, the big grocer channels like ShopRite Checkers and Pick and Pay, uh, as well as Macro. Um, Spa is also increasing the platforms available. So then it's really up to either the distributor or the brand owner to have an understanding of what platforms are available within those customer groups always check what they cost first and foremost and what are they almost what is the purpose of those platforms because that also varies from from retailer to retailer and I, I'm going to use an example from because I'm familiar with the macro platforms um, a lot of times a retailer like macro or checkers will use catalogs a winter or a checkers catalog um, to use as a range statement almost define their with their purpose, um, it's not always to, it's about brand awareness. It's not always about selling a lot. I shouldn't say this, but it's about creating brand awareness and, and, and the statement of doing what they are. Now, those platforms can be extremely expensive if you're not a, a, a high volume or high turnover product. But there is also almost second and third tier platforms available to, to brand owners in, in, a, in a macro environment for example, they've got uh, more for less campaigns, they've got vineyard value, they've got um, the, the weekend um, trader leaflets. So there's different platforms that almost play different purposes in the retailer's environment as well. Um, and that's why it's so important once again for the brand to understand, are they on a premiumization strategy? Because then catalogs for retailers is the perfect match because that's their strategy and, that, and that's what they use those marketing platforms for as well. If you are a brand that's uh, more focused on high volume uh, sales, you know, then those platforms like your weekend uh, leaflets, um, your month end leaflets, where pack and price becomes more important, is more suitable for, for your brand or your product. So it, it all comes back to who are you, what are you trying to achieve, and matching those um, needs almost um, on, on the retailer side's marketing platforms again. Fantastic. Thank you. So we are we coming to the end now, but I thought as a, as a kind of last question for you, and then we can see if there's any other questions that come through. I wanted to, to say that talking about focus, accountability, simplicity, transparency, it really does sound like a lot of work. Um, but I've heard you talk about how these areas are obviously interrelated and that if you can achieve momentum in one area, this can automatically improve another area. Can you tell me a little bit more about how this works? Sure, Jono, and I'm going to repeat what I said uh, previously at Vinpro. You know, fast, although it sounds like quick, it's not a quick solution. But there is some, you know, they do interact with each other, and you can start seeing immediate uh, positive impact on your brand and your business if you start um, taking the time out to address these, the, this, or use this framework in your business. And I, the first two that interact with each other is having a simpler brand plan or sales plan or just a plan um, does guide and help your team to focus as it does give them more clear direction and it reduces confusion. So here's a couple of examples of how a simpler brand plan can help a team focus. 
It gives clarity on the target audience, and we have touched on this on numerous uh, questions already. It gives them clear objectives. It creates consistent messaging, and this is quite important as well for brands as well. So often brands say they're following a premiumization strategy, but then they want to shout loud on a retailer's leaflet, less 30%, you know, it's just pack and price. Um, and I know, you know, the, uh, a volume or a value consumer and a premium consumer it has got different needs, but there's no way you can have those conflicting strategies and give a clear direction to, to, a, to a sales team. So consistent messaging from a, from a brand perspective is important. Um, and then also streamlining processes. Do not have 50 activities you want to implement as a brand. Specifically, if you're a big brand, choose two or three big hitting occasions and put all your resources into that through the line. So it does create a lot more brand awareness. Um, otherwise, you're just going to dilute your resources once again, and you're not going to create the impact that you need um, for, you, for your brand. Um, then the other one, the other two aspects of the framework that interact with each other is the improving transparency in your business holds people more accountable, um, as it does create a culture of more trust and accountability. And here's just a couple of examples out of my experience that could help brands. It's clear communication. Um, once again, be transparent on what you want to achieve. Um, explain why your brand exists. Um, so that there's very clear communication to your stakeholders of how should they look for opportunities that relates back to your core why for, for your brand. Um, definitely a big fan of data-informed decision-making uh, from a transparency point of view. So use the data available. Ask your distributor for insights. Um, you know, really define or go down to the essence of what you are trying to achieve because there's a lot of data out there. And having data or having access to data is definitely no longer the competitive advantage. It's extracting the insights, but then you have to ask the, the right questions. And then it comes all comes back to who are you and what do you want to achieve? Um, definitely accountability for action. You know, when you're more transparent, you can hold your people uh, more accountable for, for their actions. Um, have clear calling cycles. Uh, have very specific budget targets or expectations and communicate these to your stakeholders um, and, and measure them. And then the last one is trust building. You know, transparency does build trust with customers, employees, and, and stakeholders. And I think if there's a trust element and people understand what they need to do and what's expected of them, the accountability will also naturally come, become a lot easier. That was a... Uh... Uh, we, we don't seem to have any more uh, questions coming through. Uh, so I thought what, I, what I'm going to try and do is, uh, is summarize everything that you've said in this hour. And, uh, and I think if there are points that I missed that you think are really important, perhaps you can uh, just touch on that again. And then that will be us done for today. So, I mean, again, just to give it the framework, we're talking about focus, accountability, uh, simplicity, and transparency. But what seemed to come up right at the beginning in your discussion is that a brand needs to know who it is. I call it the Zoolander problem. You know, who am I? It needs to stand looking into a mirror and knowing exactly who it wants to be. And that is not only going to filter forward down the sales channel, but it'll also filter backwards into production, especially if a brand sits alone and doesn't actually produce its own product. So that was the, the kind of first point was to know who you are, and then to put on paper an actual plan. Because in this plan will be the ability for you to communicate this brand ethos, this identity uh, that will inform everything else in the chain. Now, you also mentioned that this focus or this um, determining of identity is not something that just happens at the start. It needs to keep happening every couple of months, uh, which brings me to the point that fast is not actually fast at all. It's slow and deliberate. It involves meditation. And uh, you then went on to talk about how an analysis of the business is essential to have transparency. You need to look at the data. You need to understand what it means. Uh, and those two are different things. Looking at data and understanding it are two different things. And where smaller businesses might not have that data, a partner like a distributor is really important in providing that support. And finally, uh, it felt like 
within that partnership, it ha there has to be a basis of trust. So you can know who you are and you can partner with someone that has skills, but if there's not trust between those two, then there's gonna be a breakdown of accountability. And finally, it may feel overwhelming, but if you can implement small, simple changes in this framework, they begin to lever up bigger systemic changes in the business, which leads to a driving forward and profitability that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Did I, have I, have I done it justice? That's spot on, Jono. That's why I said there's no quick fix. Some of our most successful brands in the industry are more than 25 years old. It, success does not happen overnight. I think it's the small incremental decisions you make on this journey um, that, that eventually will make a brand or business successful. Amazing. Well, Helen, thank you so much for uh, giving your time. And to those of you who tuned in today, we really appreciate you staying with us. Uh, for those of you who have perhaps enjoyed today's discussion, you should know that there are recordings of uh, the webinars and also Vinimark podcasts that are up on the Vinimark website under the news tab. So if you want to discover more discussions like this and more topics, please feel free to visit that and to join us for future discussions. Thank you again, Helen. We hope you have a productive rest of your day. Thanks, Jono. Thanks, everybody. And to those of you at home, have a great week. Bye-bye.